All right, thank you for the introduction and good morning, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, inviting Olga to share our uh, perspectives on the decarbonization of the deep sea shipping and the role of innovation and energy efficiency. Uh, our perspectives, they are quite different but uh, from the mainstream perspectives uh, out there. I think one of the reasons for that you see on this uh, slide where we have snipped in uh, several uh, headlines from trade winds over the last one and a half year. What you see is basically a chaos because we are now facing a situation where a lot of ship owners and other stakeholders, they try to bet on or they try to identify what the best fuel will be for the future. My point is that this is in many ways out of the control of the ship owners because we do not produce fuel. We do not uh, make uh, infrastructure in the ports and we do not produce renewable electricity. So from our perspective, it is a high risk bet to bet on one fuel for the future. What we, uh, however, can control it's, of course, the design of the ships. We can control the energy efficiency of the ships. We can control the engines that we put on the ships and the fuel tanks that we put on the, the ships. So this is basically our perspective to control what we actually can control. Now, even though we are fuel agnostic and we do not wish to bet on a, a specific fuel today, of course, we have to understand the alternatives that are ahead of us. We do this analytically and uh, uh, in combination with practicalities, and we evaluate all the fuel options on various fuel properties. And from this, we get very interesting figures. What you see in the percentages uh, in this matrix are the percentage change uh, compared to doing the same transport work as we do today with the conventional fuel. So the number that you see in this bracket tell us that to run an oddfield ship on batteries will require four sister ships just to carry the battery package. This number is for hydrogen. What you see here is that the compressed hydrogen that will require 25% of the volume of our ship just for carrying the fuel. So that is, from our perspective, not acceptable. Of course, we can look at liquid hydrogen, then this uh, uh, volume uh, is significantly improved. It is still a little bit high, but it is acceptable. But what is not acceptable for us is in order to keep hydrogen uh, in liquid form, you need to cool it down to minus 253 degrees. That's almost zero Kelvin, right? So that will uh, require a lot of energy, a lot of complexity, a lot of cost, a lot of risks to do that. So even though um, hydrogen, as I will show later, is extremely important, for the green transition in all sectors and in shipping also. As a fuel, from our perspective, it is uh, not ideal fuel on a deep sea ship. I could spend a lot of time on this matrix, but it has uh, two flaws. The first one is that the percentages that you see here on emission reductions, they are based on the emission reductions on the ship only. And that is not good enough. We have to look at the emissions also when you produce the fuel. The second one is that the emission reductions here are only for CO2. That is also too simple. We have to look at all greenhouse gases. So for that reason, we look into this matrix from uh, the Norwegian entity Sintaf. We do exactly the same. We evaluate the options that we have. Here are the emissions. And the trick now is, of course, to stay on the left side of this green dotted line. A lot of people talk about biofuel as an option both for uh, uh, transition fuel uh, and also as a future fuel. That depends very much on what kind of biofuel we are talking about. If we look at biofuel from palm oil, as you can see here, the emissions, according to Sinta, from a well to wake perspective, will actually increase 240% compared to running on VLS at home. Biofuel from wrap seed oil will increase the emissions by 28%. A lot of people talk about methanol as a green fuel for shipping. Yes, it can be, but the methanol that is in the market today will increase the emissions by 12%. And the same goes for ammonia. The ammonia that is available in the market today will increase the emissions by 40%. And 66% increase on the hydrogen that is available in the market today. So I think it's important that we remind ourselves that when we talk about methanol uh, and ammonia or hydrogen, we need to specify that we are looking at green ammonia, green methanol, green hydrogen. 
And then we have to ask ourselves, where does this fuel come from? So what we have done here is we have grouped the various alternatives in two categories, the upper two, that is ammonia and hydrogen, they are carbon-free fuels. The bottom five, they are carbon-neutral fuels. On the carbon-neutral fuels, you actually add CO2 into them. And that CO2 has to be biogenic. And I don't think we should underestimate the complexity to source these amounts of biogenic CO2. But that's not my point with this slide. The point is to show everybody that regardless of fuel choice, all of them consist of hydrogen. So that is the very building brick for all alternative fuels. But as I mentioned earlier, we are not looking for hydrogen. We're looking for green hydrogen. And the only chance to get green hydrogen today is through electrolysis of water, which is a very energy demanding process. So in order for that hydrogen to be green, we need renewable electricity. So there is a clear link here now between renewable electricity and fuel for ships, green fuels for ships. And we spend a lot of time these days in the industry, in the shipping sector, to discuss which one of these fuels are the best for shipping. But what we really should be discussing is the access to renewable electricity. Because without renewable electricity, there will simply be no green fuels. So let's start by looking at the very building brick, the hydrogen. Shipping today consumes 210 million tons of uh, very low sulfur fuel oil or marine gas oil. Now, because of the energy content in these alternative fuels, which are 50% smaller than in VLSFO or marine gas oil, we need to double the fuel volumes in shipping, up to 450 million tons. Now, to produce 450 million tons of these fuels, we need 80 million tons of hydrogen, that is 66% of all hydrogen in the world. But remember what I mentioned in a previous slide. We are not looking for hydrogen, we are looking for green hydrogen, and that is 0.3% all hydrogen that is produced today. So obviously we need to scale up both hydrogen and of course also uh, the green fuels and that will require electricity, renewable electricity. <clears throat> Shipping as I mentioned will need for full decarbonization through green fuels we will need 450 million tons. Now to produce one ton of green ammonia that requires 12 megawatt hours of renewable electricity. Uh, methanol, a little bit less, 11 and a half. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that shipping will require 5,500 terawatt hours of renewable electricity. And that is a lot. Singapore has a consumption of approximately 50 terawatt hours per year. Norway, 140. The city of Bergen, the hometown of Odfjell, 3 terawatt hours. We are looking at 5,500. That is actually 54% of all renewable electricity in the world. Now, this points at a paradox that I think we need to start discussing. And that is that we want to take more than half of the resources in the world for this to solve 2% of the problem. That is a paradox. But if you really mean this and we really want to do it, there is no question about it that we need to scale up. Let's look at the uh, global renewable electricity growth rate the last 20 years, which you can see on this graph. Now the areas that you see on top here, light blue, that is the new renewable electricity that has been phased into the grid that year that you see here. And that average is 325 terawatt hours per year. And quite uh, similar year by year the last 10 years. Now, at this speed, if this continues, ladies and gentlemen, it will take 85 years until we have enough renewable electricity, as we have said through the Paris Agreement and our ambitions, that we need 28 years from now. So that's the second paradox. This goes too slowly. And of course, we can build it. Five and a half thousand terawatt hours, we can build. But I think it's, and everybody understands that we have to build a lot of it. But I like to be concrete, and I think it's important that we bring up on the table how much we're actually looking at it. Again, for 5,500 terawatt hours, four alternatives that will be to build 5,500 terawatt hours. It will require 771 nuclear plants at the cost of $3,700 billion. Alternative two, 580,000 3 megawatt wind turbines. 
<coughs> which will cover an area six times of Singapore. 12 billion solar cell panels, which will cover an area 54 times the size of Singapore. Or offshore wind, 139,000 10 megawatt units. That will cover an area 2.6 times Strait of Malacca, 66% of the Middle East Gulf, or 30% of the North Sea. The scale, ladies and gentlemen, is gigantic. It is so big that I don't think we really can comprehend this. So let's look at what this is for one ship owner. Odfia normally operates a fleet of 90 ships, which means that we will need 1.1 million tons of renewable, uh, sorry, of green fuels, requiring 13 and a half terawatt hours. That's the same as the city of Berlin. Now to produce the fuel that Odfia, only Odfia needs will require two nuclear plants or 1,400 wind turbines onshore or 30 million solar cell panels, which will cover an area 73% of the central region, Singapore, or 341 offshore wind turbines, covering 50% of Singapore. I think it's important that we try to grasp this. This is for one ship on our own. Of course, when we are looking at these kind of land use changes and the cost and the, and the monetary cost and the material that is required for this to happen, obviously, from our perspective, the politicians, they will have to regulate this. If I had been a politician, I would make sure that when I spend $3,000 billion, that we get as much CO2 or greenhouse gas reductions as possible out of that kilowatt hour. So what we are trying to do here is an analysis where we look at where do you get the most. And if we look at the CO2 reduction potential from producing fuel for shipping, and we give that a factor of one in terms of reductions, we see that you get actually nine times more out of the same kilowatt hour, if you route that kilowatt hour into electrification of cars, as an example. The conclusion from the analysis, which is also backed by Sintep and IEA, is that production of green fuels for shipping has the absolute lowest CO2 reduction potential. And I think it's important that we have the courage to actually say it. The reason for this is the energy loss in the process of production of green fuels. Because you have one kilowatt hour, ideally you will put it directly on a battery. But as I showed you in a previous slide, that is not suitable for a deep sea fuel. So you have to go through a carrier hydrogen. And in that process, you lose 30% of that kilowatt hour. But as I always also showed you on a previous slide, hydrogen is not suited from our perspective on a deep sea ship. You have to convert it again to green ammonia, green methanol, for instance. Then you lose another 30%. And then you put it on the engine. One of the speakers earlier today mentioned this number. Then you lose 50 to 60% in that process. So you have one kilowatt hour and you end up with 0 0.2. That is 50% below the energy efficiency of the fuels that we have today in the combustion engines. Whereas on a car, it's completely opposite. The cars are at approximately 20% today and will go up to 90% efficiency. That is the reason why shipping comes so bad out of this, in the production of fuels. But then the question is, how realistic is it that this renewable electricity actually is rooted to production of fuels. When we know that you can uh, use 5,500 terawatt hours, you can get shipping to zero, reducing 650 million tons of CO2 per year. But if you had spent it on other transport modes where electrification actually is possible, then you can uh, could reduce 3.8 gigaton. Or you can shut down 2,300 coal plants and you get a reduction of five gigaton. There is another element there which we call replacement emissions. And this is the most important slide I'm going to share with you today. Back to those five and a half thousand terawatt hours, remember that that is new electricity demand that comes on top of everything we have today of electricity demand. So if we as a sector go in and we take those five and a half thousand terawatt hours, they have to be replaced by more energy, more electricity, otherwise the lights will go off somewhere. Now remember now that 36% of the world electricity is produced by coal and 61% of electricity in the world comes from fossils, including coal. 
Now that means that through green fuels, shipping will of course go to zero, but because of these replacement emissions, the net emissions, they will actually transfer or relocate to another sector and they will increase. Let me explain. Today, 2% of the emissions in the world comes from shipping. If we go in, take those 5,500 terawatt hours for green fuels, the electricity is replaced. If it is replaced by coal, which is the simplest thing to get going, then our ratio will actually increase to 16%. And we don't even know about it because it transferred to another sector. And by that, you have a net negative effect of four and a half gigaton extra emissions to the atmosphere. Scenario two, you replace it by the global electricity mix. Then you have a net negative effect of two gigaton extra emissions if this happens. And best case scenario is that you go to the EU electricity mix, which is a cleanest regional mix. And then you have a net effect of approximately one gigaton extra emissions to the atmosphere. So in other words, ladies and gentlemen, shipping's the sector's emissions, they will indirectly increase, probably between two to eight times, uh, depending on how the electricity is replaced, of course. So what I've shared with you now points in following direction, full decarbonization of shipping through green fuels. And I'm not talking about now a ferry here or a ferry there or a uh, one ship owner here or there. I'm talking about a full decarbonization of the sector. This is not only about technology. It is first and foremost about access to renewable electricity. Therefore, we urge politicians and regulators to ensure a full scale up of renewable electricity and onshore carbon capture and storage, because that is the foundation of everything. Without this, everything else will collapse. It doesn't matter if you have fuel flexible, zero emission capable ships on the water, green corridors, carbon tax, etc. if you don't get hold of the fuel. The second message to politicians and regulators is to ensure that we electrify everything we can electrify, to minimize the energy losses from production to consumer. And in this ramp up period, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's really important that we have to stop this silo thinking and look at one sector alone, as if shipping has its own atmosphere. And this goes for all sectors, of course. We need to have a holistic approach because routing renewable electricity to the wrong sector that can lead to these side effects that you actually don't see within the sector, that you just transfer the emissions to another sector. Therefore, we must make sure that we, in our desire, our true desire to go green, actually are part of the solution and not part of the problem. But that means that we have to look broader than sector by sector. Therefore, in Oddfjell, we believe that shipping's best holistic contribution until there is sufficient renewable electricity in place. If we do not change fuel today, our time will come, but not today. We will make sure that we can consume that fuel when it is available, but in the meantime, we can do uh, really meaningful emission reductions through energy efficiency. So our next new building that we build ourselves, that will of course have fuel flexibility, because as I said, we do not want to bet on a future fuel, we just want to have the technology where we know that we can burn the fuel, whatever it is. That technology exists. But the second part, which is even more important today, is energy efficiency. We need to scale up what we are doing on energy efficiency, because then we can reduce the emissions today. We don't have to wait. That means that we have to continue what we have been doing structurally and methodically since 2007. What we have, of course, had a feed performance system in place. This is the very building brick uh, for a company. One of the speakers in a panel debate earlier today also stressed this. This is the most important thing you as a ship owner can do. We have to, otherwise you are in the blind. Our system is designed so that it sniffs out automatically energy inefficiency, alert us. And we get hundreds of these alerts every day and we can work down the consumption and emissions on our ships. And we have built business intelligence on top of this, so we can determine best practice in the fleet. We can identify what kind of energy saving devices that we, would be suitable for that ship or that ship, because that can vary. And we can measure the effects of these energy saving devices afterwards. Of course, weather routing is a really important component for us on the operational side. 
Storm G, who is here today and will also talk about this, very important low-hanging fruit. As you can see, our own captains reported to us back in 2008 an average sea uh, state of three and a half meters. Today it is 0 0.6. So you can imagine what this does to the resistance through the water for the ships and what that means for the consumption and the emissions. Speed optimization, crucial. In the years from now until 2030 due to CII, speed is king. But one of the lowest hanging fruit of them all is hull cleaning and propeller polishing. You can see the numbers here. On average, in Oddfjell, we save 3.4 metric tons of fuel. That's approximately 10 tons of CO2 per ship per day because of the regime we have on this. The problem with this is that when that system in the, on the top there tells us that we need to pro hull clean or polish propeller and we actually can get it done because of local regulations, vessel itinerary, etc., it can take six months. That is why we have to look also into the technical improvements. And now we are on what we call innovation deliver. What you see here is a uh, Norwegian concept, an intransit hull cleaning from ship shape, where we have a robot this big that the crew operate themselves as the ship is in transit. So that solves this logistical issue that I just addressed. They operate this in transit, and as you uh, winch in the robot, it goes up and down and clean the hull. Fantastic concept. The problem, of course, is that it doesn't capture fouling on the propeller, obviously. That is why we have uh, deployed ultrasound technology on the propeller and the rudder area. Normally, a propeller looks like this after you have polished it. Same propeller three months later. This is 15% difference in uh, energy efficiency. After we uh, deployed the ultrasound technology, it didn't look like this after three months. It looked like this. In addition to that, there are so many technologies here, and they are right, they're ready to be picked up. Clarkson says only 25% of the world fleet has installed energy saving devices. There is a huge potential here, ladies and gentlemen, for utilizing innovations that are available to us today. Mevis duct, we have a propeller boss cap fin, we have osmosis plants which uh, is much more efficient for freshwater production. In our case, it has reduced the consum fuel consumption of the boiler system by 50%. That project with the, where you see the ship, that is our own invention, uh, together with industry partners, of course, where we took 19 of the highest consumers that we have in the fleet, did modifications on the engines, on the shaft generator, put on a new propeller uh, and a rudder bulb, and in total on these 19 ships, we reduced the consumption on average by 20% without speed loss. And by that, we brought these ships up to the same energy efficiency standards as a new build at the time. And these ships were designed 30 years ago. So I think it's a really good example of what we can do here. Here are the results from Odvia, just to motivate those of you who have not started with energy saving devices or operational improvements. What you see here is that when you compare against the kind of an industry standard, which is the average of the IMO baselines for the fleet that we had in 2008. We have improved our energy efficiency by 50% since 2008. And this will continue to go down because, yes, we have installed more than 100 energy saving devices. But this year alone, the expectation is to install 34 more. And we have plants, vessel-specific plants, every year now, from this year to 2030. But, of course, as we move forward, we should continue what we have been doing, but we must scale it up. We must utilize more novel, but still available technology. On the future oilfield ships, you will probably see sail technology. You will see air lubrication. You will see new rudder and propeller concepts, new configurations in engine room, including shore power, and much more efficient use of the excessive heat. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, Shipping consumes 210 million tons of fuel. 100 of those are lost in heat on the ships. It's incredible. What you also will probably see in the future are that one, that is a fuel cell. Van Shaya, he will uh, uh, discuss this more later in his presentation. But this is going to be the world's first fuel flexible, zero emission capable solid oxide fuel cell with the potential of reducing the consumption by 50%. Because in a fuel cell like this, there is no moving parts. You don't have this energy loss. 
it's a chemical process only. It's a fantastic concept. We have been working with Alma and other industry partners since 2018 on this, and this could be a game changer for shipping. So to conclude, and also put on some closing remarks. Obviously, there is no solution that fits all. The solutions, they will have to be adapted to trades and vessel segments. Liner services, they may utilize the fact that they trade between fixed ports, for instance, green corridors. Voyage distance or duration of the voyages will impact also the choice of solutions. As you mentioned earlier, batteries does not work on deep sea, but it definitely works on short sea. Very good concept there. So I think short sea will be the first segment where to deploy both alternative fuels, but also new uh, technology. Some vessel segments, they will also experience an earlier transition than others. I think tankers are quite late, and that is because the distance between us and the end consumer is quite long. If you look at, the, for instance, car carriers transporting electric cars, that will probably be one of the first of the deep sea operators, because I can understand it. Right. And of course, it's really important for us that to, to just underline that we need zero emission developments, we need solutions, we need technology, we need many pilot projects. Because the solutions in short sea today will, of course, somewhere down the road, they will be the solutions for deep sea as well. But I think it's really important to emphasize that, again, shipping does not have its own atmosphere. So what we do at scale, I'm not talking again about small projects or ferries, etc. But when we do this at scale, it can have consequences outside of our own sector. And we must stop this side of thinking, and as I mentioned earlier, decarbonizing one sector might transfer the emissions to another sector and increase the global emissions. Please remember that. And that will happen until sufficient renewable electricity is available. So again, we believe that the best contribution from us as a deep sea operator in the green uh, transition, uh, transition that we are in the middle of is to focus on energy efficiency and not focus on fuel change today. But we must be ready for it. And this will probably be our policy until there is enough renewable electricity. And again, I urge politicians to realize this and make sure that we get full speed on renewable electricity, new renewable electricity. Of course, Odfjell realized that we cannot energy efficiency ourselves to zero. But again, on the road to zero, we can contribute significantly through efficient operation and available technology. Innovation delivered, right? Until the infrastructure is in place. And by that, thanks a lot for the attention.